Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Katie. What I said to the kids was absolutely true. We know very little about these people that we call the wise men, the kings, the travelers from the East. We don't know much about them. But what we know is important. They were not Jews. That's the most important thing to remember in the story. They were not Jews. A Magi might have been a Zoroastrian priest, like I said. They probably were not kings, although kings will come to the brightness of the rising of Christ in one day in the future. And that future would be when Jesus came to Bethlehem. But kings would have sent emissaries. We know that they studied the stars. They weren't as much astronomers as they were astrologers, which then was considered a science because they didn't just look at the things in the sky, they interpreted them. When they saw that star, they knew that something life-changing had happened for all people, enough that they began an incredibly expensive journey and a very treacherous journey across the desert to get to this baby that they knew was a king. I would say that not only were they astrologers or priests of some sort, they were trailblazers. Now I look up the definition of trailblazer, I wanna share it with you. It's a pioneer and innovator, that's how we use it today. But originally it was a person who makes a new track through a wild country. And I like this definition the best of all, one that blazes a trail to guide others, one who is a pathfinder. Now, as I said, the important thing to know here is they were not Jews. And the very important thing to realize is this is Matthew writing. Matthew, who was the Jewish, Jewishest of the Jewish writers of the Gospels. He was the one who was writing to say, this is the Messiah you've been waiting for. This is the one from the prophecies of old, which is why Jesus is always quoting Isaiah and the Psalms all throughout Matthew's Gospel, because he's always tying it back to the original story, because we're all part of that same story. There's one consistent story throughout the whole of the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And we know that they were not Jewish, which is big because they are the first people to understand who this is, that this is a king that is beyond all kings that we've ever heard of in the world before. Now, it reminds me of a poem that I read, read when I was a kid for the first time, and I think you probably know it. Robert Frost wrote a poem called The Road Not Taken. I'm going to read it to you. And if you know it, if you had to memorize it like I did when you were a kid, feel free to, to recite it with me. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that passing there, had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing that how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in wood and I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. That's the key to this whole poem, that last stanza. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. It's about being a trailblazer, isn't it? Now, if you pay attention, he thinks he would like to see what's down that other road because in fact, the, the title of the poem is The Road Not Traveled. So he's thinking about the one he didn't take. Now I studied this because I was an English major in college and he wrote this for a friend of his. Now you have to understand Robert Frost was the first poet laureate of the United States. He became a poet laureate when I was just three years old and he died on my fifth birthday. But before that time, he had been writing for many years. And in fact, the road, um, the road Not Taken was written in 1915. He wrote it for a friend of his as a joke. It became his best known poem, but he wrote it really as a joke for a friend who had trouble making up his mind. Any situation, wherever he had a decision to make, he would always wonder if he'd made the right one. You know, the kind of person who's in the restaurant and sees what you're eating and says, I should have gotten that instead. That was how crazy this guy was to Robert Frost. And he wrote the poem sort of tongue in cheek for this friend in mind. His friend then went on to die in World War I. As I said, this poem is over a hundred years old now. But it still rings true, doesn't it? That we always think about the road we didn't take or looking at the one we did take. If it's the one that was less traveled, we, it makes all the difference in our lives. Now, when I was in college, a book came out that I was required to read in seminary. It was called The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck, who was a psychiatrist. 
called A New Psychology of Love, Traditional Values, and Spiritual Growth. He's talking about really taking that less traveled path in life. And it, one of the quotes in there says that love always requires courage and involves risk. Because to take the road less traveled is not to take the path of least resistance, which is what we're called to do. We're called to take the path of greater resistance if the other means going along with the flow. We have to make choices sometimes in our life. Jesus said this himself. This is what Jesus says later in Matthew's gospel. No one can serve two masters. The person will hate one master and love the other, will follow one master and refuse to follow the other. You cannot both serve God and worldly riches. He also says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And these hearken back to the days of Joshua when they're crossing into the promised land. He says, now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's a choice that we're called to make every day about how we're going to serve and who we're going to follow and which way we're going to go in the world. It's tough, isn't it, to decide which way to go. And I know that it's, if we look at the Robert Frost poem again, one of those lines that keeps coming back to me, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. That's the key to understanding the story of the epiphany, the visitors from the East. They went home by another road. Basically, they went home by another road because they were afraid because they had been warned in a dream by the same angel that had warned Joseph to take the baby and his mother and flee to Egypt, by the same angel that came to Joseph and said, do not be afraid to take this child's mother as your wife because the child she is carrying is holy. This is God's son. That realization changed Joseph's life forever and it changed these travelers and they had to go home a different way. I hope the story of Christmas, because we're at the end of the Christmas season now, we won't be talking about this again until next Advent. But I hope for you that this is a story that changes you. It says, I can't go the way I used to go because it doesn't work anymore for me. I've got to go the way of the star. I've got to go to the way that leads me to the Messiah. Now, how does that begin to happen in our lives? We have to change our outlook sometimes. We have to change the way we do things. We have to change sometimes our, the way we think. Sometimes we have to even change, I'll say the word, and you'll probably grimace when you hear it, but sometimes we have to change our political outlook because we have to look at what our decisions do to other people in the world. Now, recently, someone came to me and said, and I hope he doesn't watch my sermon this morning, but if he does, he'll understand. A younger pastor than I said to me, I have the best joke, but it really does sort of make fun of people with disabilities. Can I tell it to you? And I said, no, I don't want to hear it. And he said, oh, it's really funny. And I said, I don't want to hear it. Sort of a direct answer to the question of what are you going to do? Are you going to listen to a joke that demeans someone? Or are you going to say no to it? And I could say that to him very directly because he is a good friend of mine and he understood and I shamed him a little bit in my answer. I realized that. But you don't even have to do that. You can just say when someone tells you something that's racially insensitive or insensitive to a group of people, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to hear that. Reminds me of a man who was the lay leader in the last congregation I served. His name is David Pill. He's an attorney. He's a quiet man, a gentle man, but a very strong person. He lives on his family's ancestral land, their farmland. They have a stream that runs through it that people like to go and fish in and they let people come onto their property to go fishing and he was out walking his dog one morning and a man was there with his son and he stopped him and said is it okay if we fish here david looked at him and said it's all right if you fish here and i you're always welcome to come but you need to take the confederate flag off your truck first he went on to explain how that symbol hurts so many people and how that's not something that david wants associated with his property but in a gentle, loving way, he explained to him, no, you're welcome, but that symbol is not. That's what you call going home by another road once you've met Jesus Christ, because it changes the way you look at other people and how you look at the world that you live in. It says, I will stand up for the truth and for what is right. I will do the right thing. I will go in a new direction if I have to, leaving behind the things that have broken me. Now, if you look at the story of, that we read from the, the epistle this morning of Paul, Paul's talking about a mystery being uncovered to him. Paul's talking about the future of Christ while he is in jail, while he is imprisoned. He can still proclaim the truth of Christ. That's what we're called to do because what was it that we said about Scott Peck? 
that love always involves a risk and requires courage. Love always requires courage and involves risk is the way the quote went. He also says at the very beginning of his book that things are going to be difficult in life. Following Christ is one of the things that may be difficult for us because we are people who are called to live a different life, aren't we? And sometimes our different life will offend people. We looked at that when we did the study this Advent from the book called The Hidden Christmas. We talked about how sometimes people are put down for their faith or ignored for their faith and how people in other nations are actually threatened because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I maintain that Christians in the United States are not persecuted. We get our toes stepped on now and then, but there are places where to be a Christian in the world means almost certainly that your life is in danger or your livelihood is in danger, but that doesn't stop people and it cannot stop us from speaking the truth in love to others about what we are called to do. So I hope that Christmas sends us all home by another road because we have to understand that once we've met Christ, everything changes. Now, I'm sorry we can't sing it this morning because it is one of everyone's favorite hymns. If we don't drag it, we three kings. Now, I said they're not three and they're not kings, but it's such great theology. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Next king sings to the baby, frankincense to offer of I, incense unto the deity nigh, prayer and praising voices raised and worshiping God on high. And the third gift, myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes the life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. Then glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sounds from the earth and skies. That's what the gifts say, that Jesus was given gold, gold, the gift of a king, frankincense, how the priests in the temple had to go and offer this to God. It's a, something that is used in the temple worship for God and God alone. And then myrrh, Jesus was a human and he would die, fully human, fully divine. He would die on the cross for our sake and then be raised again. Alleluia, alleluia. We have to find a new way home, folks. We can't go the way we have before. I said to Mike this morning when we got on this call to, to do worship in a new way, I said, we're blazing a new trail. He said, not really. He said, we did this once when Pastor Trish was here and the, there was so much snow no one could get to church. But aren't we lucky that we have the ability to be together even when we can't be together in person? And we will be together in person soon. I know some of you will be very frustrated to not worship in person for a month, but we're going to do what we can to care for as many people as possible. It's not always easy to make a tough decision, is it? But God will give us the grace that we need to do that if we do what is right in God's name. So go forward this morning rejoicing in the fact that you have seen his star. You have knelt before him. Let that change you. Let it change you from the inside out. Because all of us need to come closer to God every moment of our lives. And if we continue to follow we will get there. I loved what Miss Debbie said to the kids this morning when I went on to say hello to them at Sunday school. She was saying, you don't have to go somewhere to find Jesus, but Jesus is with you. That is absolutely 100% true. Jesus is with us, especially when we're gathered together, not necessarily in the same room at the same time, but we're gathered together in heart and mind and the power of the Holy Spirit works in us to do great things in the world in Christ's name. So I hope now that we will continue to move forward, that we will continue to blaze new trails of service, new trails of speaking the truth in love, new trails of leading others to Christ, because that's what the Pathfinder does. Pathfinder clears the way so that others may follow. So go out into the world and blaze the trail in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and God who loves you, God who lives with you, God who reigns in you, will be with you now and always. Amen and amen.